people I am. I'm here to talk to you about ranges and algorithms. Uh, I did not really know what to title this talk. I feel a little bad about this title. I don't know that this was the best title uh, for this talk. Um, I think a slightly better title would be Functional and Composable Range Algorithms, because that's really what I'm going to focus on. Um, just as a little bit of background, by the way, I, I work at Google. Uh, I used to work a lot on Clang. I still kind of play with Clang every now and then. I work a little bit more on LLVM these days, on optimizers. So bear with me. I don't usually do like libraries, all right? Like the Boost folks, like please take pity, okay? I don't know what I'm talking about. I I'll try to learn though, okay? So the first thing I want to do is I want to give a little bit of background because I want to make sure, first of all, can everybody hear me? I know that it's kind of crowded at the back. Awesome. So I want to give a little bit of background because there's a lot of discussion about ranges and sometimes people mean different things and there's like the reflector for ranges if you're on it is kind of terrifying. Every now and then there'll be like a synth thread of emails flying through at remarkable speed. I can barely keep track of it. So I want to try and establish a little bit of common knowledge that we can use for this talk. All right, so what are ranges? This is kind of the million dollar question. Uh, in C++11, we had this, this kind of weaselly way of saying what a range was because there's this, there's this kind of sort of thing in the iterator chapter that tells you a little bit about ranges. There's also these things, range-based for loops, that try to play nicely with the iterator chapter despite not actually being you know, together or talking to each other in any way. But we can kind of deduce at least a couple of things. We, we can call std begin and std end. We get iterators to the beginning and the end of the range, right? You can walk the range, right? We kind of understand how that works. Um, if you have something which satisfies this very loose contract, then you can use that inside of a range-based for loop and iterate over elements. Works pretty well, right? We know that like vectors are ranges and arrays are ranges, all these things. Cool. With C++14, we actually almost got this baked into the, the library in a really concrete way. Um, we were going to add range constructors to all of the containers so that you could just build a container out of anything that looked like a range. Didn't have to be, you know, uh, another container. Didn't have to actually have a copy. It was really nice. It's going to be really, really nice. I'm going to come back to that. We didn't quite get it into 14. So fundamentally, a range today consists of a begin and end iterator, right, for now. And yeah, I, I'm sorry, Eric. But today, this is what a range is. So what aren't ranges, right? And I think this is actually an important discussion because there's a lot of kind of ideas about things you might be able to do with ranges or you might not be able to do with ranges. Unfortunately, I don't want to talk about that. And in fact, I think there's going to be a better place to talk about that later this week because uh, Sebastian's giving a great talk on, on you know, iterators and ranges. He's going to survey all of the thinking here and, and hopefully give a really good forum for really digging into exactly what should ranges be. A couple of things I do want to clarify because otherwise we'll all be confused. <laughs> I don't think that ranges are a replacement for iterators and Andre, wherever you are, sorry. Just, I, I don't think that they can replace iterators. Uh, I'm, I'm in the camp that iterators may indeed stay. Um, also, I really don't know the answer to this question. I don't think that there isn't an answer. I think there is, but I don't know what it is. And so I think that it's a little bit confusing to think about output ranges or output iterators and ranges. I'm not going to pay any attention to output ranges in this talk, just to kind of narrow scope a little bit, try and get a cleaner design space to work in. And we can see if it generalizes. And, and I really do mean I do not have the answers. This is a very forward-looking talk, right? This is a very hypothetical talk. And, and Please, if you have questions at any time, just, just you know, raise your hand, jump up and down, shout it out. I want to I wanna actually engage with you guys and see if we can, we can figure out some cool stuff. All right. The other thing I do have to clarify here is that we need to talk about containers, too. And we need to talk about containers a little bit more rigorously than we have in the past. Um, I like to think of containers as mutable owning ranges, right? Now, when I say mutable, I don't mean that you can mutate the elements in it. I mean that you can actually mutate the range, right? It can grow, it can shrink maybe, right? You can actually rearrange things, right? And this is, this is an interesting and, and frustrating definition because it means std array isn't a container. And, and the reason I don't want std array to be a container is because if it is, everything is hard, 
std array is, is a very frustrating thing. And, and C arrays are exactly the same kind of frustrating thing. And so I want to kind of separate containers out as something we can actually manipulate in a range, right? At a much more <laughs> deep level than what you can do with an array. The, f the, the last thing I really want to try and establish some nomenclature for is value semantics. You may have heard value semantics bantered around in a lot of different places. It's already been mentioned a bunch, you know, in, in just today in various talks, the keynote, right? Uh, there, there are lots of books about this. There are lots of experts on this in the room. Unfortunately, there is a little bit of confusion about what this term means, so I'm going to try and give a working definition for this talk. I, by no means do I think this is a, a, a really good definition necessarily. Hopefully Sean won't like storm the stage. Okay, so <laughs> I'm going to claim that value semantics implies that some type has regular semantics, right? That it's a very regular type, right? The expected operations, the expected simple operations for a value work the way you expect them to work, the way they do with an integer, okay? It's a very loose definition. I'm sorry if, it, if it's too loose for you. Um, this is actually how I think of value semantics, right? Like regular shapes, right? Like it's, a, it's, a, it's an easy to understand kind of shape, okay? And that's really what we're aiming for here. So what on earth is a value semantic interface, all right? It's not a callable regular type. No, sorry for that confusion. No, it's when, when you have an interface that actually it interacts with your data using primarily the value semantic interface rather than having you know, like lots of methods and reaching into your object and pulling pieces out and then mutating them in ways that also mutate the underlying object. And the, it's kind of confusing. You've got lots of kind of you know, relationships and things that separate you know, what the, what's happening from the actual type that's reflecting it, right? That's not a very value semantic interface in my mind. So when I think of a value semantic interface, I think of something like this. I take a circle, I give you a triangle. That's a value semantic interface. Make sense? This is not a value semantic interface. <laughs> right? Lots of knobs, right? You can plug things in. You can do all kinds of crazy fun stuff with it. This is what I think of when I see stood strings interface. Okay? <laughs> Not value semantic. Okay. So what is a functional interface? Yeah, really, I was going to put this up here. Sorry. So I know you guys probably know what a functional interface is, right? You have an input, you have outputs, right? It's kind of mathematical. I'm not going to spend a lot of time on this. But it's, it's really interesting that when you have a functional interface, a very trivial way, it forms a very trivial way to actually build a value semantic interface. Almost every functional interface you see is value semantic because it takes in a value, right, and it spits out a somewhat different value, right? It's, it's always operating in that space. It's not reaching into the innards of things. So how do these come together for range-based algorithms? What is the relevance of all of this, like, background material? I want to take functional interfaces, right, clear separation of inputs and outputs, strong immutability guarantees, right? I want to take the compositional power of a functional interface that you can compose functions, right? You can chain things together. You can build up much more complex operations from very simple primitives. And I want to preserve value semantics because one of the things I like the most about ranges is that they are values, right? Iterators aren't values. That's one of my, it frustrates me to no end because you have to have two of them to even do something interesting, right? So this is, this is what I want, which brings me to the punchline. And I, I'm sorry if you guys are a little disappointed. We're like, like 10 minutes into the talk, and I'm going to get to my punchline of the entire talk. It's downhill from here. This is what I want to write, and this is what motivates me. So let's walk through this a little bit. There's enough code here. I want to, I want to kind of make sure everyone's on the same page. So we start off with two maps. They're not in any particular order, right? Doesn't matter. That's not relevant, right? We take the map. We transform that map in some way, right? Because we're just applying a transform function to the map. It takes a lambda that specifies how it transforms each value in this map. And it does something pretty common, right? It extracts the key, OK? Then we take the same map, we transform it again, and we give it a different lambda down here. And this one's doing something more interesting. Here, we're taking the key, right? The key to the one map, and we're looking up the value and, the, and another map with the same key. So we have one transformation of this map and another transformation of this map. So we have two ranges, two ranges. Now, I think you'll agree both of these ranges have the same number of elements in them, 
right? And so we can hand them to a zip. We're just going to zip these two ranges together, just like in Python. We're going to get tuples of elements, like each element's going to become a tuple, right? One from this guy, one from this one. So we're getting a tuple representing the key from map A and the associated value in map B. Pretty useful, okay? We're going to sort them because, you know, came in unsort unordered, right? Maybe we need to establish an order on them. Then we're going to take a slice. And this is, this is just like Python slice. The slice off the top 10 elements, right? The bottom 10 elements, depending on which way you want to run your comparator. Yeah? So map B is const, therefore it doesn't support. Oh, I knew you were going to be a troll. Sorry. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, so uh, so okay, so so I have I have a delightful person down here who is compiling this in his head, despite <laughs> despite it not being implemented, and has pointed out that that map B is const here, and therefore is also not captured by the lambda. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's fine. <laughs> Let me tell you how relevant that is. Okay, it, moving on. So we take the top ten, right? <laughs> it totally does. We take the top ten pairs, right, and we put them in this entry and then we do stuff to them. Now this is pretty nice. This is a much cleaner way of writing the code than if I wrote it out by hand. And, and it gets better than this. So this is just like, this is just kind of inspecting ranges. But we can use the exact same interfaces to do kind of in-place transformations, right? I take a vector, I, I sort it, I take the top 10 and I return it. And I want to be able to write this and I don't want it to allocate any memory. Okay. No memory allocation takes place here. Make sense? That's the point. Show's over. Okay, I, I, have, a, I have a few more slides. I have a few more slides. Okay, so, so, so this is the goal, right? This is the goal. With that in mind, I want to, I want to think about what does it look like to build a, an algorithm library that would allow us to write code like this, that would allow us to design our software this way. So let's start by figuring out which algorithms we actually need to re rethink here. And it turns out, it turns out that a bunch of the algorithms, they, they work pretty well, okay? So all of these algorithms have pretty easy mappings from their current state into a state that fits this model. I mean, <laughs> things like is, right? They already return the only value that's relevant. They're not mutating anything in place, right? Sure, we need to change them from taking a pair of iterators to taking a range. But fundamentally, nothing is shifting about this interface, right? Probably the things that would be changed the most here are things like lower and upper bound, or, uh, where you might actually want to return a range, or like two ranges, or a tuple of ranges, instead of just a position. I don't know. We, don't, we can figure that out. But all of these are already operating in a functional way. Even if their interface is suboptimal, right? They're taking an input, they're doing something with it, and they're returning you what you need to know. So these, are already, these already make me happy. Okay. There are a bunch of other algorithms, which the, the adaptation's fairly straightforward, OK? Things like transform, right? I didn't even explain how transform worked, right? I, I showed you a slide using transform in a fairly complex way. And everyone looked at it and was like, oh, yeah, of course. So you take the lambda, you apply it to each element, and you're done, right? And, and that's going to be true of almost all of these. All of these have obvious direct translations, right? Shuffle is going to take an input range, return a shuffled range, right? Unique takes an input, returns the unique range, so on and so on and so on. You know, nth element gets a little bit tricky. Uh, you know, the, the, the heap ones are probably going to be a little bit tricky, but you can look at all of these and convince yourself that you can actually rotate the result into the return once we can talk in terms of ranges, which are values, right? Once you have something that is returnable, you can actually fit this into all of these interfaces. Seem reasonable? No one's like, you're crazy, man? OK. Yeah. Not yet. One thing I did want to mention is the partition, the partition interface, I think, is going to be one of the hardest ones to come up with because there are so many different use cases for partition. Exactly what we should return here as the result of partitioning seems really unclear to me, right? Because it's hard to fit partition into an output because you have to know the partition point that results. So I think that's going to be challenging, but I think it's solvable. I think all of these are solvable. We're also going to need some, some, you know, 
some more invasive changes to a few things. We have a few algorithms like fill, generate, right, for each. Uh, these don't really fit well, right? They're actually not well, like they don't not well fit into the ecosystem. That's okay because there's something pretty exciting here, right? This is actually this is actually trying to implement a generator API, right? This is trying to implement things like list comprehensions. And Eric's been, you know, exploring what what list comprehensions or range comprehensions would look like in C++. Um, I think I think that that's really really fascinating. And so I'm going to totally ignore this this pile of work. And if you want to know more about it, you should go pester Eric to give a talk about it. All right. There's some remaining algorithms, but they don't get too interesting, right? So, so mostly the remaining algorithms are these weird hybrid algorithms, right? This weird places where we've taken two totally independent things and we've just rammed them together because we had no better choice. In the old world, if there were two things that you needed to do at the same time where one dramatically influenced how the other behaved, well, just make a new algorithm. We have copy, copy in, copy backwards. I mean, I, it's just terrifying. And it's copy, right? We, what's wrong with the copy assignment operator? OK. So I think what we need are some new constructs. And I would propose we need some kind of range manipulation algorithms. I'm making up words as I go. Eric's eyebrows are going. <laughs> All right, so, so these don't mutate the values. Right? This isn't about mutating values. This is about changing the structure of the range. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to talk about four of them. I'm not trying to say those are the only ones, but those are the ones I want to focus on right now. I'm just surprised. I always, I always go first to reverse. I have a slide for that. <laughs> uh, so Marshall said that uh, he always goes for reverse first. And, and I think I have a slide for that. I hope that slide didn't get nixed when I was pruning slides out. Um, so I'm going to talk about slice filter, zip, and concat. Not all of these are new, right? There's not a lot of invention here. If you've seen Andre's talk, right, he talks about a bunch of this stuff as well. So how does Slice actually work, right? I want Slice to work exactly the way it works in Python. I think Python Slice is awesome, okay? Right? You've got a range, you've got a begin, an end, you can do a stride, right? And so, so this is really, really nice. You can, you can really easily index things, pick apart pieces, right? You can build almost anything out of slice. In fact, you can build reverse because you can just stride backwards. So sure, we might want a reverse helper, but I actually think slice is the more fundamental thing because it lets you change the range which you're iterating over and the mechanism of iteration, right, the stride. So all of the copy in, all of the kind of counted algorithms, they all just decompose to composition of some algorithm with the slicing operation to pick out the piece that you actually want. Right? It also provides a really interesting path to get to the more specialized algorithms, such as partial sort. Yeah? So, so your ranges, um, they don't like own the data that they're ranging over? Is that? Hang on to that one. I've got like, I've got like 20 minutes of talk about that. <laughs> but ask it again. So the question was, you know, uh, do these ranges own the data? And that's a very complex question. And I want to revisit it later after I've gone into a lot more detail. Um, yes? Why? Why does, why does Stride assume that? Sure, but I can pass a value larger than 1 to std next or to std advance. So, so the question here is, is uh, sorry for not repeating, the, the question here is, it's not really a question, uh, the, the idea is that, that stride is a little concerning because these might not be random access iterators. And if they're not random access iterators, then the, the fact that stride could be something greater than one could incur a, a surprising linear cost. Um, I, I don't completely disagree, right? Like, I, there, there is a surprising cost there, but you gave slice a range which was non-random access. And, and you asked it to do something. And there's no cheap way to do what you asked it to do. I don't, I don't think that you know, hiding this functionality from the users will actually help them. It'll just mean that they, they write a lot of code to get the same functionality when they need it. Uh, it it's certainly something that we, we will debate. 
Yes. So, so the, the, the comment is that this looks a lot like Valeray. Um, so the difference, the, the important difference for me is that slice is a verb, right? <laughs> and that, that, this seems silly, but this is actually important, right? Because this is, this is saying I want to do something to this range, right? I don't want to just like create a new range. I want to actively do something to it. And when you, when you, when you have the possibility for move semantics, that becomes increasingly important. No, no, you're not. But but this is true of most functions, right? Right? You're saying like I would like a slice of this. Please slice me off a piece of this range and give it back. And and I think that's a better model in a lot of ways than a new container, right? Because you might not want a container. In particular, you know, when you're actually doing these these specialized compositions, right? You don't want this. You you actually just want to mutate something else as well. I think partial sort is going to be really, really interesting in this context. And also incredibly hard to implement. Okay. So filter. Filter is yes, yeah, sorry, I have another question. It's just a detail, but maybe it will be interesting to um to have us try to view in a slice in a slice so that you can just like um you don't have to, to specify a begin and an end when you want when when you want to go through a range from this right. Uh, so, so the comment is that it might be nice if you didn't have to specify the begin and the end, if you just want to mutate the stride. And, and I completely agree. That's why I really like the Python slicing. Because with Python, there are ways to get that without like, thinking about things too much. But yeah, we, it's something we have, to, we have to be careful about, right? Because it's important that you can omit these things. Other questions? Yes? Say, say it again. So I, I go begin is uh, four billion, and it's like I don't have that. It's like and just like just random numbers. What do you want it to do? So so the that. question is, the question is what would happen if if you gave this a nonsensical value? And I think there are essentially two good good answers there. One is that that violates the precondition of the function, and the other good answer is that all of the inputs are clipped to the valid uh, the valid values for this input for the range. Uh, Python, I think, gives you the latter one, right? Where it's like you can give it any number you want, and it'll just force it to whatever whatever the the actual underlying thing has. Um, but we could also say it's a precondition violation. I have no strong feelings about this. I know. <laughs> I'm glad. I think it would be a really bad idea in C plus plus where not every every range has a constant time size to try to clip because it would mean that every time we first need to traverse the whole range in ON just to find out whether that argument you gave there, that zero you gave there, because you wrote a constant zero yeah, yeah. to begin of course, so, um, whether that is actually valid. And that, that doesn't sound very C++. So, so Sebastian points out that uh, uh, trying to clip this doesn't sound very C++, uh, especially if, if computing the size is non-constant time. It would be a lot of work to validate or, or pick values for this. Uh, maybe, maybe not. I think, I think that that's, that's a great debate that should be had with a lot more experience with implementation and with users to understand what they want it to do and what's easy to provide and what kind of contract we can actually reasonably support in C++. As it happens, right, the implementation I have makes it very easy to, to support this because of, just because of the way it works. All right. Filter. So filter is, I think, actually the simplest of all of these. It's, it's just really, really boring, right? You give it a range, and you give it a predicate. And the, the resulting range contains all of the elements which satisfy the predicate. Now, we can have a glorious, furious debate about whether or not the predicate should be removing elements from the range or allowing elements in the range through the filter. Um, I don't particularly care, all right? I, I, I picked the positive form, but that, that's a bike shed, whatever. Right? The core functionality is just that it allows you to pick and choose. And this essentially gives you every underscore if variant algorithm you ever want, plus all, including all the ones that we don't actually have today, because adding them requires adding a whole other range to the entire library. Right? You get all of these here. Make sense? No crazy questions here. Does anyone see what's terrible, terrible about this? Well, okay. There's something to me even more terrible than that. 
Filter, yeah, Beeman. Um, are there, aren't there other requirements that you place on filter? I mean, I can, if there's a dumb way and a smart way to implement that. Yes. Um, remember when I said this was going to be a very high level design talk? <laughs> um, I don't have anything approaching requirements. I'm trying to see, like, do these primitives provide the functionality we want in, in the granularity and with the, the right. As long as they're implemented somewhere, right. Even if it is exactly, right. And, we'll, and I think figuring out the exact requirements, right, post conditions and preconditions are going to be a lot of work. But I'm actually really trying to make sure we're, we're going after the right set of algorithms first. So the comment is, if you want this to not allocate memory, this is going to be difficult. Hang on to the, all the memory and ownership stuff. Hang on to it. We're going to have a lot more slides about that. At the very back. Uh, you're going to run into a problem with testing whether the filtered range is empty or whether you've reached the end of it without actually checking the predicate on all the things in the original. Yes. And, and that, that, that's the first problem, and it leads us to the second problem. You have to filter everything. And it's really, really annoying that you have to filter everything. And it's even more annoying because when you do have to filter everything, you take all of those nice random access you know, ranges and iterators you had, and it turns every single one of them into a bidirectional range. And it makes all of your algorithms slow again. So if you want to know why slice has to work for non-random access ranges, and it has to support striding, it's because we're going to see a crazy increase in the number of non-random access ranges as soon as people have filter. This is a big risk, actually, in my book. This is a very big risk. We can, we can recover some of it, though. There's hope. There's hope. All right. Zip is also super easy. Andres described zip. Um, you know, it does exactly what it says on the tin. You give it a bunch of ranges. It forms you know, a range of tuples, right? The tuples have each of the elements from that entry in the ranges, right? Um, there, there are a bunch of interesting questions about exactly what happens with you know, uneven range lengths coming into it. There are a bunch of obvious answers, and there are, I don't really know which is the right one. I don't really care, because what I know is that all of the answers I can possibly get for that question leave zip as one of the most powerful tools I don't have in my toolbox. So pick one. I'll let, I'll let the committee figure this out. I don't care, but I want to make sure we get some zip, because this thing is amazing. OK. Questions about zip? Oh, OK, here we go. Questions about zip, Sebastian. My own design, I have two zips. Because there is a very fundamental difference between a zip that only that, that requires ranges of equal length mm -hmm. and a zip that allows ranges of unequal length. And that's the zip that allows ranges of unequal length can only provide forward ranges. Because you cannot start from the back if, you, if the backs aren't in the same place. So, so Sebastian points out that he has two zips. <laughs> One for equal lengths and one for unequal lengths in order to allow the equal length zip to, to have a richer uh, set of uh, operations, to be bidirectional instead of being forward. Um, I don't know that I believe you, um, but I'm inclined to trust you. <laughs> uh, I would rather have one zip. I don't, I, so one of the things that I really like about this is that this reduces the number of algorithms. I think that's a good thing. We already have a very hard time, I at least already have a very hard time teaching all of the programmers that I try to teach C++, right? All the programmers I'm responsible for about the algorithms that we already have. I am essentially failing miserably. So I would really like to see the algorithms become both simpler and fewer in number. And so it's, it's a distinct hope of mine that at the end of this, we don't end up with this like sudden explosion in the number of algorithms. We actually get rid of some of them. And if we grow algorithms, we grow them because they're really fundamentally different. But we'll see. Another question. It's interesting in this um, also function of programming to have a zip with function that actually applies a function to, um, it, it's like zip, but it applies a function instead of creating a tuple to each like, um, so, so the idea is that uh, you might do a zip which applies a function to each element in each of the input ranges. So, so I, I kind of understand why you would do that, but my preference would be for that pattern to do a zip and to then do a transform on the zip. Yes. 
there's a, the, there, there, there exists technology to, to take a, a callable object at a tuple and yeah. burst the tuple into, into parameters for so, yeah. yeah. So, so what Marshall is saying is that it is possible to, if you if you write your lambda, you know, you write a transform on a zip, right, and your transform receives a tuple, right, and what you have is a callable that has to apply to the element. It's easy to write the the algorithm, as it were, which maps that callable across all the tuple elements. Um, and I would, I think I would rather slice it that way because adding adding uh, predicates or or functions to to zip adds a lot of complexity, and zip's already going to be uh, beastly to implement. Uh, Sebastian. On the other hand, I mean, you can do it this way: is have zip, have transform form, and then have zip with with just call zip transform, and make sure that the transform function uh, explodes the tuple. The other way around is. So Seba Sebastian was saying that it is possible to just teach transform that if, for example, the. Sure. Yes. So Sebastian again points out that, that it is possible to model the zip I'm proposing as a zip which accepts a tuple constructor as the function. I, I still believe that it is better to be simple here because I think this is, this is actually the rarer case, right? Most of the uses of zip don't need this one. And so I think, I, think I, I prefer this slicing, but that's my preference, my opinion. All right, so concat. This one is really, 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 really simple, right? It's actually really, really, really annoying to implement. Um, so, so all concat does is it takes a bunch of ranges and it produces a range that is the concatenation of them. Of course, these ranges can be different. They can, some of them could be bidirectional ranges, some of them could be forward ranges, some of them could be random access ranges. You don't know. You have no way of predicting it. So, so it's extremely hard to actually implement this. I was talking to Sebastian uh, uh, yesterday, and he was explaining that in order to implement this in C++11, he had to, to you know, start by implementing an any, like a variant, because you have to be able to store an iterator into one of any n number of different ranges, which all could have different iterators. I mean, it takes a lot of infrastructure to build this tool, despite it seeming very simple. And I think that's why it's going to prove to be quite powerful, right? It seems very simple, but if, if users need this right now, their only simple choice is to waste a tremendous amount of memory, right? And this let, lets them avoid that. And I think that's, that's a very powerful change in what, what tools the programmer has available. All right, now the reason why I like these four primitives is not because they're revolutionary, not because they're particularly interesting, right, or that like, they're shocking or that no one has ever thought of them before. It's because they compose, and they compose beautifully to the actual code people write that uses ranges, okay? And that's the key thing here. If, I, if, if you take nothing else away from this talk, it's the, this ability to compose different algorithms in a functional way where the values just propagate through them, that's, that's the number one most important thing, I think, to take away from this. Right. <laughs> yes? So when you say values propagate through them, what sort of model of laziness do you assume? Again, we're not talking about ownership yet. <laughs> so the question is about laziness and ownership, and I'm deferring it because we're gonna, there's, there's a lot more to go. There's a lot more to go. And there's this large elephant in the room. Very large elephant, very small room. So, anyone have any guesses what the elephant in this room is? Ownership, ownership. yeah, that's because you guys keep asking about ownership. <laughs> does, does, is there, does no one else have like some like, like this can't possibly work objection at this point? Because I know I had a very different, this can't possibly work objection. No one else. Your confidence is inspiring. <laughs> and I fear unwarranted. Hold on, I saw Michael. Are you just stretching? Oh, okay. <laughs> Sebastian, again. Now I just want to point out that I'll probably expect to spend the third, at least the third of my talk talking about that. I know. <laughs> it's fine. It, we'll need a lot more time than that to figure it out. <laughs> Nothing else. Yes, Beeman. I'm very, very worried about error detection. Error detection. That's, I... I So, so Beeman's concern is, is error detection reporting errors in a way that's identifiable. Do you mean compile errors? Well, I mean, depending on the actual uh, way you're composing some of these 
things, there may be an illegal, illegal operation. Because you're trying to put two things together. Yes. And you need to be able to somehow report particular things that are yeah, so, failure. So I think the way I would restate your concern, and tell me if I've got this right, is essentially this may add a lot of layers of opacity on top of the error messages you might get from, say, a debug iterator implementation yeah. when, you, when you have iterator invalidation problems. Um, I don't disagree at all. However, uh, I, I actually think, and, and I know that, that um, I think both Eric and Sebastian have talked about this before, I think that if we embed the debug checking into the ranges themselves, we can actually get significantly better error reporting than what we get from debug iterators today. Um, but I do think we're going to have to take steps to mitigate that because this is definitely sinking all of the iterators, which currently contain all of our debug logic, completely away from the programmer. Other concerns? Anyone else? Yeah, Eric. Well, your, your motivational slide that had sort on it. Yeah. There's just no way that, right? I mean, these, the, the things it's trying to sort are these ephemeral values that are created on demand. And so, like, you want to sort this stuff, but those things have to live somewhere in order to be sorted. So, like, where? Where? Merge sort. Yeah. <laughs> so, the way I put this is, how is this ever going to possibly be efficient? Like, what are you going to put things, what, what, what are you going to do to actually implement this in a way that's sane and tractable? Um, the thing that I hear the most about is actually copies. Everyone looks at this and they're like, no, 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 no. You can't copy ranges that much, right? Because they, they see this and they're like, you're going to create like, like 40 copies of my range as you go through all of your different nested algorithms, right? And, and the first thing that I, I have to point out for people who, who, who who think this way is, is you know, copies are, are what makes C++ slow, right? <laughs> no, <laughs> okay? They're not what makes C++ slow. I have, I have never debugged a real serious performance problem that made it past like the first round of like, oh wow, that was slow. And you look at your code and you're like, oh, never mind. sorry, I created millions of objects, my bad, right? I've never made it past that level of severity because of copies, okay? Copies are just, they're just not scary anymore. Uh, you know, so I'm very sorry for the pun, moving right along. <laughs> you know, we have, we have moved semantics, copies aren't that scary. Um, and the other thing that, that really strikes me is that we actually do need copies some of the time. And, and, and it's one of the nice things about this particular, you know, implementation strategy is it makes it very easy when you do need to copy to get a copy and to get it in a reasonably efficient way. Right? We have a bunch of underscore copy variants because it's slow to copy a range and then to apply an algorithm to it. We'd much rather you know, apply the algorithm in flight while we're copying. And this kind of does away with that problem in a lot of cases. Right? We, can, we can implement this really, really nicely. Okay? So I think copies aren't bad. They're actually necessary in a bunch of cases. And if anything's going to get us fewer error cases, right? it's going to be the fact that copies actually happen when they need to happen instead of never happening and needing to happen and bugs resulting, right? And when we don't need copies, we do have move semantics. And I think the key to actually implementing this type of interface is really fleshing out the idea of move semantics for algorithms, right? Move semantics across these range values as they propagate through these algorithmic transformations. And this was, this was kind of the, the, the light bulb for, this, for me for this actually working. Because as far as I can tell, in almost every case, if I, if I move you know, some container of data into an algorithm, I can implement all of these techniques with the exact same in-place algorithms that I would use today. There can't be an efficiency loss, right? I've literally got the same function calls happening. The only overhead is that we're moving a lot, but that's supposed to be cheap. All right. Now, this isn't just a hypothetical. Um, I spent some time trying to implement at least enough of this. I mean, this is a huge pile of, huge pile of work. I, but I wanted to get at least enough to actually see that the idea of moving you know, ranges through the algorithms would actually work, would allow you to do things in place with the efficient algorithms, that you wouldn't be just spending all of your time kind of making up for the fact that you funneled this through you know, an algorithm that's returning it. Right? And I, I do want to... <laughs> I do want to have a caveat here, 
this is this is very experimental and it's very much a prototype implementation. All right, I don't write complex library C++ libraries as my day job. I'm a little rusty. All right, so bear with me when you see the code. Um, I focus, focus on a small subset. I just looked at slice, filter, and sort. And sort in particular, because I think sort's one of the really hard ones to get efficient, right? It requires side storage if you don't do it right. Um, and, and I think that it actually shows that the whole idea of this, this move semantic technique does work. And I got through enough of it to be really confident that this actually works pretty well. It also uncovered some nice gotchas that I am very glad to have discovered. So, you ready for some code? Actually, look how this works. So, I first want to describe the model that I followed for R value algorithms, because I think these are the key, right? These are the ones that are going to be fast. Step one is that you just return some special range containing containerish thing from your algorithm. And all of the actual work is done inside of that, right? And when you have an R value semantic algorithm, it actually owns the data too. Okay? It has to, because the caller relinquished ownership. They moved that data into the algorithm. It has to do something with it to persist it. And the way to do this, you just move the input directly into internal storage. And you do that move eagerly. Okay? So you pull all of the data directly into internal storage that you control, you own, and you can manipulate. And then eventually, you get to apply the algorithm in place, just like you do today. Nothing different. I actually haven't written any algorithms. Everything I wrote, I ended up calling std stort or you know, std remove if. Right? There's, no, there's no actual code or logic in what I'm doing. And the other nice technique you can do here is you can actually defer the exact point at which you apply the algorithm um, so that you can even do stuff like looking for composed patterns. I wanted to at least make sure that this, was, that this door was open. I'm going to leave writing the expression template optimization engine for algorithms to Eric, but because uh, uh, that, that scares me. But I want to make sure it was possible because partial sort depends on it. Like, we won't be able to implement partial sort unless we can do this. Make sense? All right. So here is the giant morass of code required to just implement filter the algorithm. This isn't the actual functionality. So the first thing we have to do is we have to actually dig out the range itself. And this is interesting because what, what I really want here, and what I don't have, and this is one of the really enlightening things, is that I don't want to deal with this, this range type. And I don't want to write this silly remove, you know, reference remove CD qualifiers stuff. That's not, that's not what I'm actually asking for. What I really want to know is, is the range you gave me a container? And if so, what is that container type that I can use as storage, right, internally? This, this happens to work, right, to dig out the container type, but it's not a good solution. I think we really need a better solution here. For example, if you pass std array, it doesn't produce std vector. All right, and it needs to produce std vector because that's the only possible container type I can use when I get an input of std array. Make some sense? All right, the next piece is that you know is actually kind of simple, right? The predicate coming into filter, it's just perfect forwarding. There's nothing strange here. The only weird part about the perfect forwarding is that we have to tell our output, our output structure, what storage to use for that, and so you know we we tell it here. And then we test for whether we've got an R-value reference. And I'm only going to talk about the R-value reference branch of this right now. We'll, we'll come back to the L-value side of things. So you get your range, your predicate, and we build this filtered range detail, right? Pass in our various types, and it's specialized based on R-value reference. Nothing too crazy here. Just a lot of boilerplate. Questions? I want to like jump ahead. Everyone seems like staring at this thing. All right, you guys good? No? Maybe? All right. You can raise your hand and ask me to go back if you need me to. Okay. So after I go through some base classes to actually detect the R valueness, this is the actual you know, class that implements the R value semantics for a filtered range return value. Okay. Um, I'm, I'm skipping a lot of the boilerplate here because it's already, all the slides are boilerplate even though I skipped a bunch of it. Um, you know, this is a totally boring constructor. It doesn't do anything. Right? We have this little helper up here, the scratch R value range base. This thing is the most boring class you will ever find. It literally is a class that contains one member, and that member is R. And all you do is you just move R into it, and it stores it. Right? And it turns out that I needed this, this little 
bit of helper logic in every single R value semantic thing because all of the R value semantic algorithms, all they do, very first thing is they just move the inputs straight into an internal storage. So, so we've got a base class that gives us internal storage. Nothing terribly interesting there. So then we come down and we actually build a common pattern of the filtered range base by just reaching into our internal storage. The this arrow range is reaching into the base class to dig out the internal storage, not the incoming storage. And we set up the iterators. And the way the base class for filtering it works is it works exactly like anyone in here would implement it. It is literally a class which contains two iterators, right? And it contains an iterator class, which is the standard filtered iterator, right? You, it's, you can find a million of them on the internet. It's just a filtered iterator. It doesn't do anything fancy at all. Make sense? This is all glue. This is, this is actually, like, this is, and I found it interesting that, like, all this just works. All you need is glue. All right. Then you do need some little cleverness here. So remember, one of the things we wanted to do was we wanted to be able to round trip through one of these algorithms with move semantics and have it be just as cheap as doing that operation in place. Turns out that that's tricky. The way we have to do that is we have to carefully control the conversion operators for the returned like range container or algorithm container thing. Okay? We want to detect conversion to another container. Most especially, we want to detect conversion to the same container type that we got on our input. Because if we got the same container type for the conversion and in the input, then we can just keep moving down these chains and we never have to like, create new storage. Make sense? We also want to detect um, the other variant of this, which is that we got some container. We don't know what it is, but we do know we actually got a container, and it, and it follows the standard model of a container. We can't always move directly into that, but we can at least you know, move a little bit into that. All right? And so we want to try and special case these. And here's the code we end up with this. So this is, this is actually where all of the magic ends up happening. So the first version up here, you know, it's predicated on is constructible, can you build the result from the range input we got, right? It's all that's going on here, nothing crazy. If we can directly construct the result from our internal storage, cool, then we know exactly what to do. We take our internal storage, we do your standard erase remove if pattern, right? Nothing fancy here, like this is, this is totally normal code. It's exactly what you would have written without ranges, has the exact same performance characteristics, and then we move it out into the result. Make some sense? <coughs> so, yes? So sometimes this function is going to return a range, and sometimes it's going to return a container that actually owns the data. So, so about that. <laughs> So, so the nice thing is the containers are ranges, right? The other nice thing is that we don't expect for the user to be able to write a conversion, right, a conversion context to anything other than really a container. What else can you construct? I mean, it's either copy or move construction, right, or converting construction, which is just as good. Or auto, or keeping it what it is. This doesn't get called for auto. That's not a conversion context. Okay. Yeah, so this is not called for auto. Auto doesn't do this. Yes? What is range again? The capital range? Oh, the capital range. So, so inside our scratch R value range base, sorry, I didn't put all the code up here. There's just, there's just too much. Th this has a member called range whose type is R. That's all. <coughs> yes? It makes total sense, the specialization of mine. I'm just wondering whether if, there, if R is a good list here, um, would this actually be more efficient than just iterating over the filter? Because this, the, the nice thing about this is that it allows to pre allocate the storage in the target container, but I'm not sure if that's actually more efficient. So, this, where that doesn't help anyway. So, the question is is this actually better for a stood list? or other uh, uh, non-random access iterator where, where to do the filter, we're going to have to walk the entire range. Um, the answer is, I don't know, and, and, and I actually don't care, but for a very strange reason. 
it's possible that there are going to be some edge cases because there's a trade-off with std list, right? It's not a clear-cut thing. There's this trade-off balance. The nice thing is that if I were to do this operation in place, this is the code I would have written. So the performance of this algorithm in the in-place pattern of x equals, right, filter move, of that move x, right, is exactly what I would get if I wrote the obvious C++ in-place code. I'm not comparing it to the obvious C++ code, I'm comparing it to my range-by-range. Sure. Um, so, so it's possible we could do something to, to tweak this even further, but I'm actually quite happy that we can just maintain the performance expectations of programmers today. Uh, the previous question was just uh, trying to get clarification about the, the exact type of the range member. Other questions about this? Okay. So what happens when, when the types don't match, right? When you can't construct, oh, sorry, is there a question back there? No, oh, okay. Um, what happens when the types don't match, right? When you can't construct the result type directly from your temporary storage. Well, what we look for instead is we try and say, you know, can we build the result from a pair of iterators, right? The common range-ish pattern that we have in all of our containers today, right? And if we can do that, well, then it's not going to be perfect. We can't share the allocation, but, right, we can do, we can use a move iterator to kind of, you know, speed things along. And yes, I should technically speaking check that a move iterator of iterator is valid here, but that's not, that's not the key thing, right? So we can actually still move the elements even when we can't move the storage. And so we can get very, very close to the optimal code the user could have written to implement this logic. Sound good? Yes. Does this work for map and set? Yes. This works for map, set, list, vector. I think it even works for forward list, although I didn't really understand why. I went through, so, so, <laughs> so this is actually, I'm glad you mentioned this. So, so, so the question was, you know, does this actually work for map and set? And that's actually a killer question because one of my concerns when I was writing this is that I'm sitting here and like, I was thinking like, what am I actually doing? Why am I doing this? How on earth is testing for constructability from my internal storage sufficient to conclude, oh, I can totally do erase remove if. That doesn't make any sense. There are a bunch of things which don't support erase, okay? But the bunch of things that don't support erase actually turn out to not be very many things at all. It turns out to just be, I think, std array. And like maybe a couple of other weird ones I, I didn't find. You can't change the size. Yeah, you can't change the size, right? So of course it doesn't support std erase. But the nice thing is that I actually have a variant of this which I, I didn't want to show because it's absolutely terrible, which actually has a full-blown type trait for detecting an erase member which accepts two iterators. And once I wrote that, hold on, hold on. Once I wrote that, I started to really think I'm doing something terribly, terribly wrong. There is no reason for me to conclude that because a type has a constructor from my internal storage and has an erase member that happens to take two iterators, that it's a container that I could legitimately move into. Right? It gets to your point. What, why is this a good thing to, to give up ownership to? And you remember at the beginning of the talk, I said how we weren't really doing a good job of, of thinking about the abstractions of containers, right? We have iterator traits. Most of the range discussion has proposed some range traits to understand the different properties of ranges, but where are our container traits? Because we really need to understand whether or not this conversion operator is actually the one we want, or if we need to disable it and use something else. Make sense? Okay, Ahmed. Aren't set elements constant, therefore removed if it doesn't work? Yeah, that's what I was going to say. You can use remove if you compile this? <laughs> So, so the question is, aren't set, aren't set element, uh, const and thus uh, move if won't work? I did not compile it with set, sorry. I did compile it with list. It doesn't matter what iterator category we have for the, for the container. The, the constness, sure. But again, I don't really care, right? The key thing is that there should be some pattern in here. That's the code you would write today if you wanted to implement a, a filter-like thing in place and we can actually find a place to put the in place code inside of the functional style range algorithm and it still runs in place whatever that code ends up being right and we'll have to specialize it a million ways right um, it seems like you have this containerness intrinsically embedded in your approach 
the storage uh, is is a container. And I, I was wondering if you have plans to factor this out and make give many user a choice for that. So. Yeah, that's that's. I really want to give users a choice for that because there are a bunch of. Sorry, the the question is, uh, you know, yeah, summing up your question. Uh, right now, the container is totally baked into this, and it's it's halfway baked in because it's baked in on blind assumptions about the interfaces containers happen to have, but it's it's still baked, right? And it would be nice if both it weren't it weren't you know blind and if it weren't baked. And I think we can actually get both of those with the same technique, right? If there's a good traits model for containers, right, then you can even control that trait model, right? And if you're giving it a range, which isn't a container, but you know what range you want to use, like what container you want to use anytime you need storage, for example, for sort, where you always need storage, right, then you, you, like you can just tell it, oh, OK, I'll, I'll specialize the range traits. That's fine. Um, the other thing is that I think it'd be nice if you could have more fine grain control. So one of the things I would really like is if you could cause you know, uh, the, the, the containerness to collapse to a particular container mid-algorithm. The interesting thing is you can. You just cast it. And it turns out that works. Other questions? Why not remove the container concept completely? Why not just uh, have an allocator allocate memory for you? And it's like, you originally gave me something that had a range that had a memory or a container. And thank you, I'm just going to basically make it a vector-like object. So, so the question is, why, why, why deal with containers at all? Why not just allocate your own memory? Um, no reason. Uh, it's convenient. Uh, the biggest reason in my mind is so that I can write this line. Because writing this line is what makes this uh, the cost of two moves over existing code. And I don't know how to write that line unless I actually hijack a container when I see one coming in. That's what it comes down to. Other questions? What happens with initializer lists? Does it have the same problems as array, possibly worse? Uh, the question is what happens with initializer lists? Does it have the same problems as array, possibly worse? Yes, and yes, and yes, worse. <laughs> uh, all, of, all of the things which can act like a range, but which uh, fundamentally are, uh, don't have storage, we need some way to special case the R value, the R value uh, scenario for them. And that's one of the reasons why I think it would be really nice if we had more, more of a traits approach to specialize things, right? So that you could actually tell algorithms, it's like, no, 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 whenever you need storage and you've got this incoming thing that you can't use for storage, this is a storage type that's obvious. Because almost all of them are going to just say vector. And so it's going to be a really easy trait to implement. Yes? There's these two notions, containers and ranges. And it, I like the idea of getting rid of the container part. What about just using a different type of range, like an output range? That's a great question. I have no idea. We'd have to figure out what output ranges are first. I don't know what they are, so I'm not talking about them. That's really, that's really, that's really what it comes down to. And I, I suspect, I don't know, but I suspect it won't have a material impact on the interface. It's mostly going to have an impact on how this implementation takes place and how customizable you can, like how much you can hijack this to do other stuff. Sorry, the question was uh, why not? Why not go to output ranges instead of containers? And I, I don't because we don't have output ranges. We have containers. Yes. So, uh, I'm sorry. Say that one more time. Yes. Yes. Uh, yes. So, so okay. The question is, uh, how do we figure out for a filtered range, right? How do we compute begin and end? Um, I, like I even use begin and end down here, and I didn't actually explain how I built them. Uh, the, way, the way we do begin and end is, uh, I don't know if you've seen a filtered iterator. We, we literally take the begin and end of the incoming range, and we wrap that in a filtered iterator. And we store those. And, we ex and that's what begin and end here return. I didn't, like, I didn't put the slide up because I didn't, I didn't invent this. I literally went and read up on filtered iterators. And just. Do you not take advantage of 
mean, the, the operation is in place. Because you do this operation only when you do this conversion. Then if you define the end used in interrogators, uh, the performance that you uh, get uh, doing this conversion are, are not... Uh, yes. So the question is, um, or the observation is that if you, if you use begin and end on the result of this, right, then those, those have to do some work, right? And it may not be in place work, right? And, and it, may, it may be excessive work, and it may be redundant with this operation. That's absolutely true. Um, but that doesn't happen, right? And, and even when it did happen, you would have already been in a situation that you needed to burn memory one way or the other, right? And so, so it, it's the same problem you have with an in-place thing. Whereas, like, if you put this into a range-based for loop, yes, we'll have to filter the range. If you then, like, if you, if you store this, use it in a range-based for loop, and then move it into some other container, we'll filter the range twice. But we're going to walk the range twice no matter what. Maybe we could do something. I'm a little worried about it. I, I think I actually have a slide about this, though. Any other questions before I move on? Implementing this, you really have like three levels of complexity. You have to deal with, you know, the semantics of what an iterator is, the semantics of what a range is, the semantics of what a container is. Yes. And you're hoping, I guess, that with these primitive values, that the users aren't going to be exposed to this. They'll just think about ranges, right? So, I'm, I'm just wondering, do you think that that's that's realistic? Am I going to have to write code like this, or, or not? Qu the question boils down to: Is any of this? horrible complexity I have up on the screen that's a, a mere fraction of what we would actually need to productionize this going to leak across to the users. And I, don't, I clearly don't know the answer to that. Because they haven't productionized it, I haven't put it in front of a bunch of users and seen what happens. However, I've implemented a little bit of it, and I've written a bunch of tests for it, and the tests look really dumb. Like, they have no idea what's going on under the scenes. And they even get nice error messages, like, like I, have, I have some static asserts in here at strategic places. When I, try and, when I try and do something with the std array and it clearly isn't going to work, the compile fails and it says, yeah, I, I, can't, I can't resize a std array. I'm sorry. <laughs> and so I don't see a lot of complexity leaking through. Certainly not more than our current algorithms do. So I just want to say that I had the same experience with my range library. So the range implementation is crazy complex. Completely insane meta programming there. Uh, the usage, it, it, it's very simple. It doesn't appear, even in the algorithm implementations, the, the, the complexity behind the, the range is not there. Yeah. Uh, Sebastian was just agreeing and saying that this, this matched his, his experience working on the same. All right, so I, I want to move on a little bit because I want to get through a little bit more uh, information before we run out of time. So, uh, what about auto and capturing? This is a big fear. It was a big fear for me, big fear for a lot of people I talked to. Like, what happens when this gets stuck in a variable somehow? What really surprised me was that this just works. It's, it's kind of beautiful. So, we've already moved all the storage into our algorithm implementation, wherever that may live. When we capture it in a variable, we capture the storage too. And it lives there, and it's fine. And you can, like, put this in an auto variable, and you can write your range-based for loop over it, and then you can move it out of a variable later into a container, and all of it works, and it doesn't matter. And there's, like, the, the complexity losses, like you get, are kind of what you would expect for repeatedly running a filtered iterator over a range, right? There's no, there's no like, surprise, right? It, it just kind of works. You don't get any bugs in your code. I was really happy about how that turned out. Uh, yes? Uh, no, actually, I'm pretty sure that I want to filter it up front, but when I was implementing it, um, that wasn't clear, and I haven't updated all of my implementation. Sorry, the, the question is, like, why don't you just filter it up front? Right? You, you filter it some of the time, why don't you just filter it up front? And, and, and it, that's actually not an entirely fair answer. There are two reasons for it. One, you don't want to ever filter it up front in case you're going to get some other composition opportunity later on that's better than doing the filter by itself. So you want to, you want to at least delay it a little bit. But we should probably just do the in-place filter every time. I was really worried about that, and I was trying to be extremely lazy. I thought I had a slide on here about, maybe it's later. I have a slide on here. One of the big question marks is how lazy should you be? Because a bunch of these can be implemented very, very lazily, 
right, as just like, you know, very lazy views. And it's not clear how much of that we should do versus just doing it up front. I mean, as, as I've worked on it, I've actually come around to the conclusion we should just do it up front. I don't know. I think experience will tell. It doesn't change the interface, though. Well, so, so Marshall points out, again, you know, if, if you just you know, filter and then you slice, you don't want to have done the filter up front. But that's what I mean when I say you want to defer it a little bit, at least, because you want to expose kind of the core composition opportunities you have. But Do you plan like, things like top 10 elements will also go a little bit inside and you can yes. avoid? Yes. The, the question is, like, do you do top 10 partial sort rather than full sort? And yes, I showed that on my, my like dream slide, right? That's that's specifically one of the things I want. Yes. So I would argue strongly in favor of uh, separating eager algorithms from lazy algorithms, providing both, because uh, if you are mixing eager and lazy, then it becomes impossible to reason about how many times you're traversing a sequence. Yes. I. I so Eric, Eric is arguing that we should we should not have. We should not have a mixture of lazy and eager. Um, I, I'm, t I'm torn on this. So, so the number one reason why I don't like the, the, the lack of mixture is because I don't want to have twice as many algorithms. And it would be exactly, like the number of non-lazy ones is tiny. And so it means almost a full 2x to the space. And I think that's a very high price to pay. Um, I'm torn on it though. I, I, let me keep going. I don't want to try and figure out the answer today. I don't know it. <laughs> All right, so uh, L values are actually a little bit tricky. Um, I, I'm not a big fan of I wasn't a big fan of L values at first because uh, here, here, this is literally the mental process I went through in trying to design the L value semantics, right? So simple model, right? You just copy it, right? There's this really easy model. As soon as you see an incoming L value, just copy the whole thing just like you moved it with the R value one and it looks exactly the same as the R-value semantics. Even better, after the first algorithm, it turns into the R-value semantics. It's quite nice. It works really, really well. It's beautiful, right? And, and you know, it's, it's, it's kind of useful in some cases because for something like sort, for example, there isn't this incremental and like really beautiful algorithm that we should be using instead of copying and just applying the algorithm directly. So maybe we should do that, right? Maybe that's the way we should go. But then I, then I got worried about how many times I would be traversing this, this range, right? We traverse it again and again and again, and it's not clear that's actually the right approach. So maybe we could be lazy was what I thought. And so this is how all the laziness got cut through all of my implementation was like, okay, we're going to just, just store enough information in the L value case to lazily reconstitute the view that we want to have, right? Really, really nice, right? We'll only copy when the algorithm absolutely necessitates it. Once we copy it, We'll switch it over into the R value kind of semantic tree. Everything else will follow that semantic tree. Um, this, this, this seems really great because if you think about all of these core range manipulations I mentioned, all the things that are the primary compositional elements, they work beautifully lazily, right? They work so well in this model. And so it seemed like it was a really good idea. And then I implemented it, and I was very, very sad. So lazy is really complex. I am, I, I am increasingly losing any, like, any appeal of laziness. Because once you move to lazy, you quickly erode all of the fast iterator categories. Because there are a bunch of different algorithms here, which if you want them to be lazy, they'll force you to go down the hierarchy of iterators. Okay, filters the prime example, but there are others. Yes, Sebastian. Are you even taking into account the broken iterator categories in the current set? Uh, am I even taking into account the broken iterator? Could be random access to vertical, but it's really just input because it usually. No, 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 no. So, so I'm not. I'm not saying that we're forced to kind of degrade. Um, th this is the same question. <laughs> so the question is again, right? Am I, am I taking into account the broken iterator categories in the standard? And the answer is, uh, I, I am taking them into account in that I'm completely ignoring them. Um, so, so what I mean when I say that, like, that it requires this lowering, right, is that the algorithm itself fundamentally must lower the iterator category, right? Filter must put you down to bidirectional. 
if you do it lazily. You have no choice, right? You, like, game over. And once you do that, every subsequent algorithm that you compose with, lazy or otherwise, gets slower. So yes, you save yourselves these repeated traversals. But you also, like, kill yourself, absolutely kill yourself, by actually kind of undermining the efficient iterators that you might have started with. Bartosz. But if you are lazily filtering an L value, what happens when the L value starts mutating under you? It's a great question. <laughs> Bartosz asks, if you implement all this stuff lazily, what happens when that input starts changing? So, <laughs> and, and, and Eric answers, don't do that. Well, so Eric, I agree with you wholeheartedly. Unfortunately, my users don't. <laughs> I really wish people wouldn't do that. And I think that if we ever actually got this kind of a functional range algorithm library really widely deployed, we could probably get them to not do that. Because because they would actually learn and they would start actually say, no, 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 if, if, if I was going to mutate it, I would have just embedded it in the algorithm, moved it in, right? If I'm asking you to make a copy of it, it's because right now it's immutable. It's just sitting there. It's a reference. You can just refer to it later. But it's, it's a big concern. It makes the entire thing more bug prone as well. So laziness both causes a complexity, or causes a complexity spike. It has the potential to degrade performance when it lowers the category of your iterator and it exposes you to a large number of bugs. I have a hard time arguing these days for laziness. What I don't have a hard time arguing for is doing just enough laziness to detect composition. Handling the composition opportunities to simplify things and then just doing it in place on a copy. I think that's probably the right answer, but we don't, we don't have enough experience to know yet. I know I don't have enough experience to know yet. I don't think anyone else does either. All right, concat, <sighs> concat's a pain. Concat's a lot easier in the R value, it turns out, because in the R value case, you just make a decision, right? In the R value case, you just say, look, we're going to pick one of your inputs, its type is going to become the storage, we're going to append all of the others, right? And you're gonna have one range, and it's gonna be fine. You can, you can implement concat, no problem. But if you want it to be lazy, and in the L value case, you get down to the like the any like uh, the variant you know thing, right? You have to be able to represent all of these different iterators in flight the entire time. Another layer of complexity, another potential layer of slowness. Really don't like it. And so by the time I got through concat, I was starting to go back from this like you know yeah lazy everything and think maybe we should just copy. Like may maybe copying is just not that bad. But you actually can't. <laughs> and you can't because how do you create a copy? Like, when you're implementing slice for, an, for a range which has input iterators, right? You, you can't increment past the start position, right? You know, so, so we have to like store this distance out of band if we want to do this. It's really, really nasty, right? And it's supposed to be one of the things that, that like the ranges make go away. And so I'm, I'm still a little bit worried here. But I think copying might be better on the whole and we might have to just deal with input iterators differently. And the other problem comes back to, the other problem with L-value semantics is that once you go to L-value semantics, it again becomes really hard to pick a container type. What storage do you use? Because now I don't, I, kn I don't know that I can move your container in. And that brings into question, is the container you give me as an input the right container to use? For example, if you, if, if you call sort on a list, right, without move, I would much prefer that sort constructs a vector of those elements and runs sort on the vector, which is incredibly more efficient than on a list, right? And it's just, it opens up a whole can of worms. Again, having explicit control over how the container storage, like story is managed as you progress through these algorithms, I think is going to be inevitable in this world if you want to have really good performance. So Question. Goes back to do the container erasure, and then just allocate raw for your everything. And so, so, so uh, the, 
the comment is this, this you know, might again push for, for not using containers but to allocate raw. And I again say we have to be able to move into a resulting container. And we can't do that from a raw allocation. I, which the response is unless write conversions. I don't know how to do that. I, d I, I, I can't figure out a way to do that today. Another question? So the, the comment is that we might be able to solve the concat problem by actually exposing the concatenated sequence to the subsequent algorithms. Um, I think that would work, but I think you would trade the pain and the iterator for the pain and the algorithms. I, I don't think there's, like, it's a fundamental thing that you're going to have to adapt across in different potential, uh, like, things, ranges, iterators, whatever they are, you're going to have to adapt across them, either in the algorithm or in the iterator. The nice thing about doing it in the iterator is that you do it once. Sebastian? And, and Sebastian also points out wisely that this, this also, you know, uh, harkens back to the segmented iterators paper, which is essentially trying to generalize this challenging iterator design so that we don't have to keep building it each time, if I remember it correctly. It's about making algorithms more efficient by moving complexity, having, being able to split complex iterators into several simple iterators. I see. The algorithm can work multiple passes over simple iterators, which might be more efficient. Yeah. I, I think hopefully the people in the recording can go read the segmented uh, iterators paper. Yeah, Matt Osmer wrote that. It was a long time ago. All right, so I want to keep going because I've got a few more things I want to talk about. I've already talked about this plenty. Um, so so the one theme through here is these careful control of conversions, right? The, the, the per algorithm logic is necessary for each of these conversions. Per container logic is sometimes necessary when you have containers that support different operations. As Ahmed pointed out, set is going to potentially require a different, uh, uh, a different conversion operator than list does because it has a different set of semantic constraints. And the, the interesting thing is uh, that the only way you can get to do this is if you have conservatively enabled conversion operators on your range algorithm implementing return types. And it turns out we almost broke this forever in C14 because we almost baked into every container a generic templated constructor to take any range looking thing and construct that container out of it by copying. <laughs> Once you have that, you don't get to write these conversion operators. They don't fire at all. They're just ambiguous. Um, and, and that was literally one meeting away from shipping in C14. And instead of enabling uh, some exciting ranges thing, actually constraining severely the range design space. So I'm, I'm very, very glad that this paper, which a good friend and coworker of mine wrote with my encouragement, um, <laughs> like, oh, sorry, to be clear, right, I thought this was an awesome paper. I was in the committee lobbying to get it into 14, not realizing the damage that it would actually do. The conversion operators are actually key here. And we don't actually need the functionality that this paper provides. It turns out that conversion operators are more than sufficient, more than sufficient. Still, I do want to reemphasize, I'm not trying to make these things faster. I'm trying to make them not slower, right? It's a different bar, OK? And eventually, I actually think expression templates are going to be useful here, right? I really think that we're going to need them for partial sort. I don't want more algorithms just to avoid them. And once we start going down this path, there's a ton of opportunity to actually do really, really nice combining operations on composed algorithms. But it's not necessary for it to be a success. That can be a nice incremental improvement that we do here, right? I think we can hit the current performance of in-place algorithms pretty easily just by using the ranges and by using move semantics. As long as moves are free. Sorry, there was, there was kind of a caveat here. I've been assuming that moves are essentially free pointer swaps, right? Because everyone writes move constructors that are free. Yeah, so we've got some work to do, unfortunately. We have to eradicate throwing move. This is an abomination, okay? 
I'm not taking any questions or debates. Throwing move is an abomination. Don't do it. Okay. We also have to make moves alightable, right? It should be a completely valid thing to move aside and move back and have the implementation say, no, you didn't. You didn't move at all. We're not calling any move constructors. Because as soon as you implement this elision, right, then x equals sort of stood move of x is exactly as efficient as doing sort in place today, right? And that's the bar. That's what we need to hit. I also would really, really like to do this identity swapping thing. I had this really great idea for it, but I did not have time to give you an example, and we don't have time to show it anyway. So there you go. So this is just a start. There's a lot more we need to cover. Uh, so range assignment or output iterators, what did these even look like? I actually kind of like the idea of replacing the whole concept of output iterators or output ranges with just doing an assignment into a range because this, this looks really nice to me. Like, I like this a lot. I like this a lot too. It's just the analog to tie, right? Yeah, Eric. So you had uh, began this talk with uh, ranges as value types, right? Yep. So like zip x, y return some type, call it x. Right? And it's a range. And it's a range. And what if the right-hand side is also of type X? Okay. Well, does that do like a shallow copy of the range, or does that copy all of the elements? It's ambiguous. Is, okay, I would not expect it to be a shallow copy. So what if a range is just two iterators? So, so the fundamental question is, uh, what happens if, if you end up with this assignment and you end up doing a shallow copy because they're the same type? Um, Assume that a stood pair of, of, uh, of pointers is going to be a valid range, right? Uh, no, I'm not, I don't want to go there. That, I don't, that's not what I'm saying at all. So, so, so Eric was saying that, like, that we can't change the assignment semantics of a pair of pointers. And if a pair of pointers is a valid range, then there, there's an existing range assignment, which is a shallow copy rather than a deep copy. So um, a pair of pointers is not a valid range today, fortunately. I would like it to not be a valid range because I would like for assignment of ranges, if we ever get it, to be the equivalent of doing a, a copy, like std copy on the iterators, right? Or std move on the iterators if there's an R value semantic on the right hand side. And that, that copies and moves the values. But it certainly is up for debate. Quickly though, uh, we're running out of time. Yeah, so the first line is nice, but it feels inconsistent with the mental model I built during your talk. Uh, so, so Sebastian points out that this is deeply inconsistent with most of what I've displayed in this talk. Yes. There are values, and they kind of own the, the elements, and they don't reference back whatever yes. the elements came from. So, so, like so, so X cannot modify X. So, so Sebastian is saying that, that slice X cannot modify X because it doesn't own the, the, the elements in X. I completely agree, right? And, and I also completely want this. And, <laughs> and that's why this is future work, because I don't have any idea what this should look like. All right? Um, I really want to keep going and show a couple more slides, and, I, and I'll take more questions afterward. Um, so the other thing I really want to mention is, is splice. We haven't talked about splice, but splice is really, really important to a lot of efficiency guarantees and a lot of real world systems. And none of what I have described ever uses the fact that lists can be spliced for free. And I think that's terrible, but I also have no ideas yet. Like I just haven't spent any time thinking about how to cut splices into this type of an algorithm library so that we leverage them when they're, when they're beneficial. But I think there's something, some work that needs to be done there. There are definitely more algorithms that we do need once we go down this rabbit hole. Here, here are at least three that I am aware of today. I'm really sure that I'm not aware of all of them because I found out about one of them uh, yesterday over, over drinks, and thank you for that. And Bartaj, I'm sorry that I had to find out yesterday about Folder and Foldel. I'm very sorry. All right. <laughs> very, very sorry. I'm not, I'm not well versed in functional programming. I'm trying, though. So we need split. We need the ability to take a range and turn it into a range of ranges. And we need the reverse, join. When you have a range of ranges, flattening it out into just a range. Right? These, are all, these are kind of other fundamental things. Instead of just mutating a range, they impact the nesting structure of ranges. The problem is that split and join have 
crazy complex interfaces in every library I've ever seen that implemented them in really powerful ways. And so I think designing these two algorithms alone is going to be a monumental amount of work. There's even a paper about just designing a split library for strings alone. And it's a huge paper and it's a ton of work because it's just so complex. Um, Fold, as I was rapidly educated last night, is kind of fundamental to list manipulation. Um, I don't know why I didn't have it up here, but we need to have it up here. And the other thing is that I've presented a very slice-oriented and vector-oriented view of ranges. There is another perspective on ranges, which is a more lisp or list-oriented view on ranges, which might be better. I don't know, OK? That's another place where I think there's a lot more work to be done here. <sighs> Come on. So I'm going to skip. Um, any, well, hold on. Sure. Any questions? Yeah, there are a bunch of questions. Just so you guys know, I do have backup slides, but I don't think I have much time. So, if you, so questions or backup slides? It's your choice. Slides. slides. All right. So I lied. I'm going to talk about what a range is. <laughs> also, thank you for letting me do that slide. I love this slide. So, so <sighs> two iterators is the nuttiest idea I have seen in a long time. Um, so I work in a code base every single day, which has a preposterous number of range-like things in it. And I think some, some disturbing like 30 or 40 percent of them have a sentinel end iterator, which is an end iterator that has like this weird type variable thing jammed into it, just to say like, actually, I'm not an end iterator at all. I am the sigil, which when you see me and you compare equality with me, you will call this other arbitrary pile of code over here. It has nothing to do with iterators. Sorry. Two iterators is wrong. It's deeply fundamentally wrong. Eric has great blog posts about this. <laughs> great blog posts about this. So Andre, uh, over, however, no, nothing against you, Eric, but I think that you really undersell the importance of how bad two iterators are. They're so much worse than that. So you, Eric points out a lot of the inefficiencies of having two iterators. I, you know what? Like, I'll deal with the inefficiencies. The code I have to write to implement two iterators for a large category of range things in my code is absolutely insane. I have had more bugs with broken Sentinel iterators than I have had with iterators, right? And I thought iterators were supposed to be bad to debug. It, it, no, it's just nutty, OK? Andre gets the severity of the problem right in his talk. Unfortunately, he takes it to a bit of an extreme end. I know that's shocking, Andre taking something to the extreme. <laughs> so OK, one iterator is quite nice. I would like to have an iterator. Um, I would like to be able to denote a position. I don't think we need anything new. I don't think we need to invent a position thing. I think iterators work great for this exactly as they are. The end iterator is the disaster. Again, blog posts. Please go read them if you haven't yet. These are important. All right, so what do we do? Um, Eric has proposed this iterable concept. Um, I think, actually, Sebastian's going to give a much better treatment of it in his talk. There's also a blog post where Eric gives a very thorough treatment of it, down to and including code. It makes Sentinel's tons cleaner. It really cleans this up a lot. But I still am not satisfied. I think there's something better here. So I want an iterator and a unary predicate. I don't want anything else. Because this is the simplest possible expression of a range. It is a position to begin iterating and a condition at which we stop iterating. And Sean points out, unless you want to count base range, I don't know why I can't put a count into my predicate. Because you can't change it. I, well, I'm sorry. Uh, s sorry, Sebastian says, because you can't change it. No, I reiterate. I don't know why I can't put a count into my predicate. I didn't say keep the count up to date in my predicate. <laughs> so, 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 Lisa. Yes. You, you, sorry, sorry. Two, two different interpretations of the word count. Uh, yeah, so, so the count could be the, the number of times we wish to increment. Right? Um, a counter of increments could be stored inside the iterator. Or you could compare you know, the iterator. Like you could actually store the beginning iterator in your predicate, not mutate it, and see if you've traversed enough distance 
right? There are all kinds of ways to implement accountable iteration. And all of them can be implemented very cleanly in terms of this. Yeah. So Sean, Sean points out that, that, that yes, you can, you can implement it like this. You can also implement countable and iterable. And there's a really weird problem where that actually then pessimizes the algorithm implementation. OK, totally agree. That's, that's an excellent point. Um, that's why slice. Because with slice and an expression template, you can specialize the algorithm for a count when that's useful. The, the reason to, to put it another way, the reason to embed a count in your, your range, your range itself intrinsically, is when the actual range of data carries a count, not when the algorithm needs a count. notion of a container range or whatever it is, just have a library of algorithms that work on containers that know how to handle our values and come up with a category for containers so that you can have different sets of algorithms that work well on lists and other <coughs> algorithms that work well on vectors, right? So now you can come along and you can string functionally together a whole set of algorithms that work on vectors or string functionally together a whole set of algorithms that work on lists so, uh, to, to I, I apologize for the brevity. Sum up that for, for the video, uh, if it's still even rolling. We're, by the way, we're past time. If you guys need to go, just go. It's not a big deal. And they're going to kick us out soon, I think. Um, the, Sean, Sean's point was uh, there's, there's a dichotomy between a range, which is, is you know, not potentially owning, right, may not have a container that underlies the range. And a container, which is definitely owning, owns the elements. You know, you can make it into a range. Why not not make it into a range and actually have algorithms over containers and over ranges? Is that essentially? And specialize the algorithms when it makes sense to do so. That sounds fantastic. I would love to do that. As long as I can spell all of those algorithms the exact same way, and as a programmer, completely ignore, like, what, what, what the difference is. I don't want to think about this. If I have a container and I pass it to my sort, I want it to do the right thing. If I have a range and I pass it to my sort, I want it to do the right thing. Yeah. Both of you just hate your standard library and, and yes, and, and Marshall correctly points out that both of us essentially hate our standard library implementers because we want them to do all the hard work. <laughs> <laughs> uh, one more quick question. Well, I was just, now I'm confused. Uh, for the earlier part the ranges, um, and they deal with the container, what about uh, a, a range that is a subset of a container? What about a range that is a subset of a container? And then we go ahead and use this sort of thing and, oh, never mind, because on our values, when they get passed in, you can destroy everything. Yep. Um, so so, so the, the, to sum up the, the, the progression there, wh what happens when you have a range that's a subset of a container, but you're doing the R value semantic stuff? And the idea is that we actually just keep destroying the container on each level of the R value semantics as necessary, because we get to do that with R values. Yes? So it is like oh, fine. Here I thought I would get us to wrap up. So or not. <laughs> so one, one very elegant thing about Eric Niebuhr's iterate is that just because the begin and end are allowed to be different types, they don't need to be different types. Which is important because you can't do bidirectional bi iterators any other way than having the same type for both begin and end. And so I don't see how your representation can ever hope to have bidirectional iterators. So Sebastian points out that bidirectional iterators don't make sense here. And no, they don't. 
Um, at the same time, the thing that really bugs me about the iterable thing is that underneath the iterable thing is this exact thing. It's called done. Returns a bool. Accepts the iterable. Right? <laughs> I, I, like, I, I, I feel like, like we clearly have an iterable thing, and it's, and it's papering over the distinction between essentially a bidirectional iterator and a random access iterator or a forward iterator, right? And maybe what we really should do is have both. Because I really do hate the standard library implementers. <laughs> <laughs> I, I say to a standard library implementer, of course. Any other questions, or should we get out of here before John, you know, like kicks us out of here physically? All right. Thank you very much. <laughs>